بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنسة تمارا غري We are very honored to have her here uh, for this conference. She was born in 1966 and hails from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and she became Muslim when she was 18 years old. And over the next eight years, she finished her education, her BA in political science and education, and her master's degree in curriculum theory. And she had her two daughters. And during that time, she frequently visited Damascus. And we pray for the people of Syria, inshallah. And she began her to seek her formal knowledge. And alhamdulillah, that led her on a, a long path into a deep study of the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and a deep study of the Quran and the Islamic sciences. And an ijaza in Quran crowned her work in tajweed. And her topic today is "Lean In: Our, Fem- Our Feminist Manifesto." And we know feminism is one of these hot topics we deal with. Feminist discourse has not only led to a radical restructuring of Western society, it has also presented a number of challenges to Muslims. Have the basic texts of Islam been interpreted in a patriarchal fashion that denies women fundamental rights? Is wearing hijab merely an oppressive manifestation of male dominance? And what does Islam teach about women's rights? We are very excited and it's important to, to recognize scholarship, particularly from our females, and that we want to see more, inshallah, of our females engaging in this type of scholarship. And it's sad that Sister Ansa is our, or Tamara Gray is our only female speaker. And inshallah, in the, in the future, we'll be having many more female speakers. And we recognize that and we hope to correct that, inshallah. Without further ado, Ansa Tamara Gray. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wassalam ala Sayyidina al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah, wa barakatuh, is that good? In 1848, the Declaration of Sentiments was signed in Seneca Falls, New York, by 62, 68 women, and 32 men. It was the beginning of a movement that was later to be called feminism. It was a declaration of the issues that plagued women at that time. Issues of political exclusion, property rights, marriage and divorce laws and problems with those laws, and issues of morality and independent accountability. In the same year, 1848, Muslims were plagued by the colonial period. The colonial period, which began in Asia, moved to Africa, and spread to the Arab world where the nation states were carved out after the Ottoman period. This colonial period brought with it great detriment to the status of Muslim women. In West Africa, during the pre-colonial era, women had benefited from the influx of Islam. And there were scholars and social activists, the most famous of whom is Nana Asma'u, who is a prolific writer, a poetess, an educator, an activist, A creative educator, she developed a system of education that brought Islamic scholarship and education to women in the villages and in the cities. Before the colonialists, women in West Africa participated in the economy. Their education included functional skills as well as Islamic scholarship. A Nigerian scholar, uh, Ogun Shea, says about women of the pre-colonial period, a woman who was without a craft or trade, or who was totally dependent on her husband, was not only rare, but was regarded with contempt. Women before the colonialists came to Africa 
had political power. In the Khalif of Osman Dan Fodio, women were part and parcel of the administrative systems that were used to uphold the Ummah. In Zadia, a queen, Amina, ruled successfully and turned her land into a powerful commercial center in a walled-off city. If we move across the continents and go to the subcontinent of India, during also the pre-colonial period, we find that women there also had political and social power. In the 13th century, Razia, the daughter of Shamsuddin, was appointed as sultan. Her father appointed her to his sultanate because he found her more worthy and more capable than his sons. At his death, his son contested and took over the sultanate anyway. But he was not a religious man, and so he failed his people. Razia took what was rightfully hers and took over her father's sultanate. Sultan Razia, and she preferred to be called Sultan and not Sultana. She preferred it because there had never been a woman who was a Sultan, and so the Sultanas were just wives of the rulers, and she wanted to make it clear that she was indeed a ruler. She established schools, academies, research centers, and public libraries. Her public libraries included copies of the Quran, books of Hadith, and books of philosophers, to name some of the things that she had in her libraries. If we go to the Arab world, we find numerous female scholars, and we can include Umm al-Khair al-Dimashqiya, who was a muhadditha, or a narrator of hadith. Her death in the early 16th century was a prelude to the coming centuries of colonialism and the upcoming dearth in female scholarship. When Europe ruled the Muslims, they brought with them attitudes towards women and a woman's role that began to change the attitudes of Muslims themselves. For some, women simply ceased to be recorded as educated. If we go back to West Africa again, families resisted sending their daughters to the Western colonialist, colonial and, of course, Christian schools. Some still educated their daughters in the Islamic system and in Islamic scholarship, but they were still recorded as illiterate. There is an example of one woman whose name was Malimar Ashidakando, and you can see her for evidence of a woman who was recorded as illiterate but was a scholar of Islam. However, the focus of education did change, and so women were losing their public presence which had been the norm of their more Islamic life in the pre-colonial period. The period between the 16th and 20th centuries is the lowest period of Islamic education for women in our history. Issues of political exclusion, marriage and divorce laws, and independent accountability have become relevant. The reasons for the declaration of sentiments in the United States have now become rampant for Muslim women. And though original texts encouraged political and social activism, fair and safe marriage and divorce laws, and individual accountability towards God, Muslim women find themselves today in oppressive situations both publicly and privately. In the face of this deterioration of the rights of women, toward the end of the colonialist period, feminism began to find a place and to take root. While there were indeed political reasons for this and political agendas involved, there were real issues that needed to be addressed. Instead of addressing these real problems, however, feminism became synonymous with anti-Islam or the non-religious woman. It became a westernization rather than a clear and honest look at the political, social, and economic problems and issues that women were facing. The feminists called for a removal of the veil or the hijab 
and the hijab became a symbol of the femi- or the anti-hijab became a symbol symbol of the feminist uh, movement. It became a symbol of oppression. The religious element responded to what they perceived as an attack on the morality of women in the fabric of society by turning a blind eye to the real issues and pandering cliches about women in Islam. Our men and women became confused and a rift began to develop. This rift between those who would take on the word feminism as a banner to help eradicate the very real issues facing Muslim women, to the exclusion of classical Islam, and on the other side, those who reject the word feminism and all it insinuates and make hollow speeches about the rights and responsibilities of women in Islam, thereby functionally ignoring the very real issues women today deal with. Thus, the theological fault was born. We sit today at the awkward rift of two plates. The plate of a Muslim populace who was brought up under the after effects of the colonial period. And the plate of that same Muslim populace that is looking at the time of the least Islamic scholarship for women as well as for men and thus carries into our perceptions a level of unprecedented ignorance. Where these two plates crash together, post-colonial culture plus ignorance, the earthquake of the issues of women in Islam occurs. Our religion does indeed deal with the issues of the feminist movement. It deals with all the issues the movement was originally developed to deal with. Islam provides solutions that are practical. They are without bitterness. They represent equality and fairness at its most elevated level. Islam addresses political and social inclusion, issues of identity and issues of home and family laws. Islam does not need Western feminism, not in its past constraints, nor in its very modern, updated look. Muslims, however, who have allowed Western thought to intrude into their perception of the Muslim woman, could use a jolt of Western feminism, especially if it will bring them back into the foray of the Islamic solutions for our problems. The Western feminist movement was all but dead until Sheryl Sandberg published her book in March 2013, Lean In. And this reignited the movement with new fuel. Her book, Lean In, was fascinating to me because it said much of what I had been saying to Muslim women for the past 15 years, especially in the title. And the title is the most important point made in the entire book, Lean In. For Sandberg, this phrase summarizes what women should be doing at work. For me, it summarizes what women have been ordered to do since the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Women at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not sit back and wait to be asked to join up. They did not sit around wondering, is it okay to participate? They leaned in. They leaned in politically. Nusayba bint Ka'ab leaned in when she, as one of the two women who gave bay'ah at the second aqaba, gave her full support to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which included both military and political support. Later, we see her in battle after battle, fulfilling the promise she originally made. She did not sit at the back of the room and wonder what should she do. She leaned in and made a promise and made a difference. They leaned in civically. Al-Shifa bint Abdullah, who was a muhajira, entered Islam as a healer. 
she used her medical skills and her literacy skills to lean in to both Meccan society and Medinan society. The Prophet ﷺ supported her skills and appointed her as teacher of literacy and her healing arts. Later, she will lean into public life when Umar ibn al-Khattab appoints her as finance minister or director of the marketplace. She leaned into the civic sphere of service and succeeded in education, public health, and economics. They leaned in socially during the Battle of Khandaq, Rufayd al-Aslamiya pitched her hospital tent and received the wounded. The Prophet ﷺ in clear support sent Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh to her tent when he was wounded. Rufayda saw a need, leaned in, and provided it. They leaned in and were paid equally for their work. The Prophet ﷺ's aunt Safiya radiallahu anha defended the strong house or fort when Hassan ibn Thabit proved incapable and received an equal share of the spoils of war. They leaned in religiously. Imwaraqa's house became a masjid for the women of Medina. She had a beautiful qira'a, a recitation. She leaned in, asked for, and received a mu'adhin at her home. In every way we can fathom, we read stories of the women in Mecca and Medina leaning in. The given was women are part and parcel of society. They are responsible. They must take on their share of work and care for it. And when the hijab was established, this became the greatest lean in of all time. Now women were asked to be the courageous standard bearers of their faith. They were asked to stand forth as representatives of the believers, to be known. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Ahzab, Ya ayyuhan nabi. Say to your wives and your daughters and the female believers, to draw upon themselves their jalbabs. More suitable that they will be known and not be harmed, and Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Arabs today run into the mistake of assuming words in the Qur'an or the Hadith or the Seerah carry the same meanings as those words carry in modern usage. The word jilbab is one of those words. If you look up the word jilbab in my favorite dictionary, Lisan al-Arab, which is the quintessence of the Arabic dictionary, you'll find that it has more than one meaning and that the meaning in this context is khimar or headscarf. And this verse says that this headscarf should be worn that we might be known. And yu'arafna. There are pat explanations that people like to throw around about why women wear hijab in Islam. Most of them are irritating stories about women as pearls and diamonds and oranges. And I even heard someone tell me as watermelon. These explanations equate women to objects of decoration or pieces of fruit. But if we peel back the human interpretation, we find that Allah, Azza wa Jal, Allah himself has laid plain the reasoning for hijab. That we may be known. Like a sports team, we recognize each other. Like an ethnic background, we feel comfortable with each other. 
Like a flag held high in the field of battle, we bravely go out each day in every country of the world representing our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, representing our religion, representing our men who too often blend into the background, representing our hurting women who need our activism, representing any woman of any faith who does not know how to show her conviction. We wear the scarf that we might be known. The second, the second part of the verse, that we may not be harmed, is not, I'm sorry to say, a guarantee of a flawless life. It does not mean that you will not receive hurtful words from an ignorant soul. It does not mean you won't be mocked or even that you won't be oppressed. Indeed, if we look to the prophetic example, we understand that neither men nor women ran away from physical harm or life-threatening situations. If we look at Mecca and then later at Medina, we find that women easily put themselves in danger to defend their faith. They did it with the approval and support of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Women in battle like Umm Salama and Nusayba bint Ka'b. Women on missions like Asma bint Abi Bakr and Rufayda uh, bint Aslamiya. Women who fearlessly spoke the truth like Umm Sulaim. And women who risked their emotional well-being like Zainab bint Muhammad radiallahu anhun. So the goal is not to protect a woman's physical or even emotional self, but rather her spiritual and psychological self. That which bolsters a woman's self the most is a sense of identity. By wearing hijab regardless of the men in her life, regardless of the society she lives in, regardless of anything but her personal conviction. She gives herself a layer of strength and protection that can be penetrated by none. Giving women this strength is, in and of itself, the beginning of solving some of our serious issues, though I realize we have much more work to do than just to wear a piece of fabric on our heads. The women at the Prophet's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, leaned into their religion. When the verse was revealed, وَلْيَضْرُبْنَ بِخُمُورِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ That the women should close their scarves at their dress slit. It is narrated by Aisha that the women tore their embroidered fabric. Fabric that was decorated with pictures of tents. In other words, fancy fabric. Fabric that was valuable to the woman in some way. Either because of time spent embroidering or money invested in this more expensive fabric. They tore this fabric and covered themselves with it. It is akin to the Muslims throwing their alcohol in the streets when the verse forbidding alcohol was revealed. No one ran around looking for a man to ask permission of nor did they question their own interpretations of the verse. They understood. They followed through. They leaned in. And we follow in their footsteps when we too lean in and embrace this flag of our religion, this hijab. With the phrase, lean in, Western feminism has found some truth. The truth of individual accountability. Women, lean in. This is your life, your faith, your family, your country, your job. You are the only one who will be asked. Lean in. At this juncture, I would like to lean in in a way that I hope, I must admit, I hope it will please, it will please the female audience 
and perhaps give some new perspective to the male audience in the room. I'm going to talk to the men. For years, women have had to endure men telling us our rights and responsibilities. And this isn't payback. Well, maybe just a little. I counsel... <laughs> I counsel and listen to women daily tell me tales of woe. Some of these problems are brought on by their own foolishness. And sometimes their problems are just qadr that must be faced. But a disproportionate number of those problems are stemming from you, the men in our lives. Now, I will assume that not a single one of you are the cause of any of these problems. But as men, you know other men. And you have access to them. You have access to the troublemakers. So I ask that you make a culture that considers the following. Number one, don't worry, there are only three. Number one, lean in to your household environment. Stop complaining about the house. Women do not like drudgery. Laundry is drudgery. Picking up junk, it's drudgery. Dishes our drudgery. It is often said that the Prophet ﷺ would help out at home. This is not true. The hadith does not say, كَانَ يُسَاعِدْ فِي بَيْتِهِ Rather it says, كَانَ يَعْمَلْ فِي بَيْتِهِ This is a semantic difference. It does not say, the Prophet would help at home. It says the Prophet would work at home. This is a semantic difference, but it is a very important distinction. To say he worked at home as any one of you work is to take on the responsibility of the home. To say he helped means he's a good guy because he picked up his towel. Housework is not the Islamic duty of the Muslim woman. In the Hanafi madhab, it is required that a Muslim man relieves her of such duties with paid household help. And if he does not, then he has to compensate her for the duties that she does. Imagine the sin incurred by the man who not only doesn't work at home, does not provide for the household, does not hand over cash, but also complains and whines about the state of the house or uses the state of the house to control her goings and comings. Or worse, yells at her because his laundry isn't done. These are sins incurred and hanging heavily around the necks of our men today. Start imitating the Prophet ﷺ, not by helping at home, but by taking responsibility. Change the culture. Remember, Muslim women are not first and foremost your cleaning ladies. Your wife is not your in-house maid and neither is your mother. If she does, that's if she does do, if she does clean the house, and if you are one of those lucky people who has magic drawers, when you, every time you open your drawer you have clean socks and clean shirts, then you are at the receiving end of her goodwill. Her goodwill and her charity. Treat her in the same way you would treat anyone else who went out of their way to make your life easier. Make hers easier to live. So lean in to personal responsibility at home. Number two, lean in to her personal development and support and celebrate her accomplishments. I heard of a man who upon hearing of his wife's imminent graduation, and let me say she has more than five children, or she has many children, and homeschooled every single one and was graduating from college. He said to her, good, you'll have more time to spend at home. Does this sound like the answer or the words of our Prophet ﷺ? Does this sound like the words of one of his close companions? Many young women come to me and tell me that when they said to their suitor, I'd like to work in my field, the answer was, if your household duties are done, you might be able to work. 
an answer that says, your hope to contribute is not valuable to me. Our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the early Salaf, radiallahu anhum, were of those who lavished well-earned praise and supported people for their accomplishments, men and women. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about Khadija radiallahu anha, she believed in me when no one believed. She believed the truth when people thought I was a liar. She supported me with her wealth when no one gave me. And Allah granted me children from her and not from anyone else. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not dismiss her loyalty as expected, but continued to appreciate it with his words even after her death. He said about Zainab, radiallahu anha, she was the best among my daughters. She suffered for my sake. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an said about Umm Salama, let anyone who has a mother like Umm Salama come to me. And he said this because he had established a salary for her as a teacher of fuqah. It was a challenge. The Prophet sallallahu recognized the shifa radiallahu anha's professional success and rewarded her. Rewarded her for teaching Hafsa to read and write by asking her to teach her the healing arts as well. When Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would enter a room, her father, the Prophet of all humankind, would stand to greet her, take her by the hand, and bring her to sit next to him. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave bolstering words to Safiya, radiallahu anha, speaking about her to others and saying, she has embraced and perfected her Islam. He spoke with recognition of strength and devotion when he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said about Nusayba bint Ka'b, radiallahu anha, I never turned right or left without beholding her fighting to defend me. Again, and again, we hear stories of support and celebration of women's accomplishments. So do not be the one who stands in the way of your daughters or wives or sisters or mothers living a full life. Pay for extra schooling for more degrees. Take care of the children so she can attend classes without being in a bad mood when she comes home. Pay for a nanny to care for them twice a week while she gives back to the community and learns herself. Be the crutch she leans on, the person she laughs with, the person she knows will stand beside her, not the person she has to fight in order to grow. Be as our Prophet ﷺ was. Lean in to her personal development. And the last one. Lean in to a spiritual life and a joyful life. Create a serious worship schedule for yourself. Enough of the paltry, fuddled prayers that are the habit of most of the serious of our ummah. It is time to get up at night. We as an ummah must bring back this most important sunnah prayer. We must pay heed to Allah Azza wa Jal when He says to us, Qum al-layla illa qalila. Get up at night, stand at night, but for a little. And when He says, Wa min al-layl fasjud lahu wa sabbihu laylan tawila. And of the night, prostrate yourself to Him and glorify Him during the long night. And Wa min al-layl fatahajjud bihi nafila talak asa an yabathuk rabbuka maqaman mahmuda. And rise from sleep during the night. It is an additional prayer for you. Perhaps your Lord will raise you to an honored position. We must come to this prayer as Tamim ibn, ibn Aus, radiallahu an, who when he missed his tahajjud prayer on one lone night, repented for an entire year, praying all night, every night, for a full year, Repenting from one missed to Hajjud. The result of this spiritual leaning in should be joy. Bring joy into your home. Smile 
Make a conscious effort to smile. Say thank you. Thank your wife, your mother, your sisters for the nice things that they do. Compliment, find something, anything. Find something nice to say every day. Celebrate, find reasons to give gifts. The Prophet ﷺ said, Tahadu tahabu. You will find a happier home is a home wherein lots of gifts are given. Read Quran in your homes, play, smile, laugh, bring the prophetic examples into your homes. Cheer up, I beg you, cheer up. Lean into your families with your own worship schedule and with smiles, thank yous, compliments, and celebrations. Finally, the situation of Muslim women today is not one that would be recognizable by our Prophet ﷺ. In his time, he turned a patriarchal society on its nose. He supported women in the military, women working, women in all aspects of social and public life. Because we are a faith and not simply a social theory, the core issue for men and women was and remains his and her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order to give this life, in order to live this life, he وسلم, taught all of his companions, men and women alike, to lean in. Faced now with a post-colonial culture and unprecedented ignorance, women and men must imitate this sunnah and start leaning in once again. We must learn and seek knowledge. Men, be your wives, daughters, mothers and sisters, greatest cheerleaders. Spend your money on their education. Do not find yourself bitterly resenting less service at home. Remember that women were, were not created to do laundry, but rather to worship Allah and serve humanity as you were. Follow in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad and be of those who can say proudly when you speak of your wife or any of your female relatives, take of your religion from this one. Men and women, lean in. Learn Arabic, memorize Quran, celebrate each other's victories, get degrees, study Islam, learn in an organized fashion, attend Zaytuna College, attend the Rabata online courses, lean in. Lean in with hijab. Men, you cannot force a standard bearer to carry the flag of war. For if it is not carried with strength, the entire army will suffer. So do not be of those who force your women folk into hijab. However, be wary that you are not of those who deter her. Do not be of those who fight against her desire to carry that flag. Women, lean in to the responsibility. Wear it and stand proud. You are not an orange. You are not a diamond. You are a Muslim woman. Stand up and be known. Let us nod at the declaration of sentiments with our own declaration, a declaration of sunnah. Let us not run from the word feminism, but recognize what is within it that is valuable to our path. Let us lean in and be finally and again believers men and women alike. Alhamdulillah, Thank you very much.